Hi everybody, Steve here. This is another video in the series on how to make generative art. In this video, we're going to be looking at 3D graphics or WebGL. What you're seeing here is a work in process using 3D graphics. This Cheery Quilts project also used 3D graphics and this landscape uses 3D graphics. This will by no means be a complete overview of WebGL. I'm just gonna cover the basics of what you need to get started with making generative art in WebGL. If you want a more detailed overview of WebGL, I'll suggest this coding train playlist. I'll leave a link in the video description. In order to start using 3D graphics, we have to add something to the back of this create canvas. We do comma web GL, and now we're in 3D mode. If I put in a rectangle now, say at 0, 0, 0200 size, it appears here instead of in the upper left hand corner. The reason for that is in WebGL, 0 is in the center instead of at the upper left. Let's get rid of this, and we'll also do rect mode center. This looks just like 2D graphics though. How do we know this is 3D? Before we draw this angle, let's do a rotate. So we can rotate, but instead of just rotating like we normally do with 2D graphics, that is rotating around the Z axis. We can rotate now along the X axis and the X axis, let's see, that goes this way. So that rotation would be like this and the Y axis goes this way. So that rotation would be like this. So if we rotate Y pi times 0 0.3, say, we get this. And then if we rotate uh, along the X axis, we get this. And we can rotate along the X axis and the Y axis, and we get this. Now notice that a rectangle is actually quite thin. It's only one pixel wide. We could change this to a circle if we want, and that will look like this because of its rotation. But now we have access to some extra shapes that work in WebGL 3D graphics. We can do a sphere, and actually the sphere doesn't take an XY position. All I would do is the 200, and there is our sphere. Now notice it's got all of these lines in it. That's because a 3D shape is made out of a whole bunch of uh, polygons. If we don't want to see those polygons, we can do no stroke. Of course, it's hard to see that this is a sphere now because it just looks like a circle. But let's try another shape that works in 3D, box. So we'll change this to box and we get this. Now let's take off the no stroke and that's what that looks like. This box is 200 in the X, the Y, and the Z. So if we did 200 comma 300, 100, that would be the Z, we get something like this. Let me change these rotations so they're not so extreme. So we'll see that this is the X, this is the Y, and this is the Z. But if the arguments in here are only the width, height, and depth, what does that mean for how we place this block? Well, we have to translate. So you'll find in WebGL, there's a lot of push, translate, and pop. So let's translate uh, 100 comma 100. So we've just moved the X over to the right and down 100, but we can also translate on the Z axis. Let's make that a little more extreme. We'll do 300 and it's gotten closer to us. So if we do negative 300, it goes farther away from us. Let's put this back in the center. I want to show you another shape, an ellipsoid, and misspelled it. There we go. It looks like a big egg. Let's move it backwards so we can see more of it, and we'll put it closer to the center. Now the reason it isn't centered is because we've rotated. If I take these off, it will be centered. So why was it down there in the corner? It was because we rotated first and then we translated. If I had translated first and then rotated, then it would still be in the center, but in a rotated position. So let's move these down to here and we'll get rid of this. We'll rotate it a little bit more 
Another useful shape is a cylinder. So cylinder, and I believe I need to take one of these off. There we go, cylinder. It has a radius and a height, not a diameter like circle. I could make this a radius of 20 and we would get this. And then of course we could take the stroke off and we get this. The fill works the same way. We could fill 22500 and we get a red cylinder. If we look at the P5 reference page for cylinder, we'll see that we also have something called detail X and detail Y. This has to do with how many subdivisions, how many polygons are being used to make the circle of the cylinder. Here's a polygon with detail of seven, and here it is with detail 20. If we have a larger number, the circle will be more smooth, but it will take more processing in order to create that shape. Some of the 2D primitives have a Z component to them. So here's the quad. If you do a quad just in 2D, it's X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. But if you do a quad in 3D, then you do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Here I've drawn a quad in 3D. Now we can't really tell it's a 3D until we rotate it. I put this into the draw loop, added a background for the animation. I've got this uh, variable rot x for rotation x, and I'm rotating by rot x. So it's going to be adding 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. So if I comment this out, it will start rotating along the x axis. I can comment out the y, and it'll start rotating along that axis, and then the z axis as well. It's still sort of flat, but it actually has a curve to it because the Z's are all in different places. Let's try exaggerating that a little bit more. There we go. Now you can kind of see more of a curve to it. Another 2D shape using X, Y, and Z is a line. And there is our line rotating around the canvas. Point can also have an X, Y, Z. Let's just copy all of this down to here. And we'll make this a point. And we'll comment this out. And let's make the stroke weight even a little bit higher. And there is our point wandering about the canvas. That's kind of interesting. Let's uh, take the background off. We get a very interesting uh, curve to this. This is something new for me. I hadn't expected to do this. We can use a vertex shape in WebGL with an XYZ for each vertex. Here's what that looks like rotating. And we can also do curve vertex with X, Y, and Z. If we look on the P5 reference page, there are other 3D primitives that are available. And there's also a whole section of other things that are available in 3D mode, including lights and material. I'm not gonna go into detail about lights, materials, and texture, but here's an example in the P5 reference that shows a directional light which is similar to the sunlight and I'm moving my mouse around and you get this. Here's a function that changes the shininess of an object and I can move this. The one on the right is supposed to be more shiny although I think the one on the left looks more shiny to me and I believe you have to be using specular material in order for the shininess to show up. Right, specular material is shiny. I have not used this in my projects though. There's also on the P5 site an example section, and you can see that there are some 3D examples here. So if I click on materials, you'll see examples of different materials. You can use texture to put an image that you load onto a shape like this. Here I put my own image onto a box, and you'll see that it looks squished. This is the original image. That's because the original image is wider than it is tall, and this box is square. So I would have to make this box the same aspect ratio as my image in order for it to look normal. Here I seem to have fixed it by making the width longer, but if I spin it around some more, you'll see that in this direction it looks even more squished. You can also create your own texture using create graphics. Here I've got CNV equals create graphics 300 300. This does not have to be a WebGL create graphics. I'm just creating the texture, 
I've got a red background and a blue rectangle in the center. And then in texture, I put CNV here instead of IMG for the image. So it stretches the rectangle here. But if we look at this side, it looks like a square. There is a camera setting, which allows you to change the perspective. The first three arguments are the X, Y, and Z position of the camera. And the next three arguments are the position of your sketch. In other words, where do you want the camera to be pointing at? So here I put a box in the middle of my sketch. The camera is back here looking straight at it. But if I raise the height of the camera, now the camera is up here looking down at the box. And so we get a different result. And if I move the camera off to the side, it's still looking at the center of my sketch. So now the box looks like this. You can get the same result by using translate and rotate so that you're actually moving the scene and the camera stays where it is. So you just have to choose which one do you want to use. Translate and rotate the entire scene or do you want to move the camera around? If you wanted a user to move about a 3D landscape, then you would be using the camera. Let's look at some practical examples now. We'll start with my cheery quilts. I've created a buffer canvas and I called that CNV2. And then I'm creating the camera on that buffer canvas. And I've got some if statements so that I get different camera angles for the finished product. So if I hit play a few times, you'll see that there are different angles. This is really the only reason that I'm using WebGL. For each of these little squares, I create a buffer canvas, but that is not WebGL, it's just a regular 2D canvas. And once I've finished creating a pattern image on that buffer canvas, then I place that on CNV2 with image. I'm not using texture here. In this landscape example, which I will be leaving a link to, this consists of tall boxes and trees. I'm using several Perlin noises in this example. I've got one Perlin noise for gradual evolution. I've got another Perlin noise for more bumpy terrain. So those are layered on top of each other. Here is the Y value of all of these boxes. And you can see I've got the noise for the bumpy, the noise for the gradual elevation. I've also got a general terrain height. All of this is in a for loop, but instead of an X, Y for loop, it's an X, Z for loop. So I've got X going across, Z for the depth, and then my Y is determined by the Perlin noise. One thing to keep in mind with 3D is my X values have to stretch farther than the width of the canvas. This might be 400 width, but if I have 400 for the stretching of the canvas, the beginning and the end, uh, you would see the edge of the canvas going right up here. So I have to make my canvas about twice as big so that you don't see the edges way in the back. I'm also using another Perlin noise for the color. This is all green, but there are darker greens in here. As each of these boxes get placed, there's a calculation of whether there's going to be a tree or not. The tree is based partly on Perlin noise and partly on random. That's why you have a clump here from the Perlin noise, but you also have a few random trees over here. If I am going to make a tree, I call a make tree function that I created. The make tree function first decides on a size of a tree, then it translates up half the size of the tree so that it can place a cylinder and the cylinder is also based on the size of the tree. After it places the cylinder, it translates up farther, and then it starts filling in the blocky branches of the tree. I've basically got an X, Y, and Z uh, nested loop here, and I keep translating back and forth in order to fill up that tree. Here's my work in process, Ghost City. The first thing you wanna do is set up your camera angle or translate and rotate the scene you do that before you place any blocks. I then decide how big the scene is gonna be and how large the skip is because there's also going to be a for loop here. Then I call a backdrop function, which is filling in the sky. The stars are all points. This is a sphere. And this fogginess that you see here is a whole bunch of low alpha circles. Next, I called a make grid function 
which is creating all of this stuff out here. And I have a nested for loop going through the X's and going through the Z's and then translating based on the X and the Z. And then there are some random sized boxes. These are all boxes that have no fill and a low alpha on the stroke. After my make grid function, then I move on to my main objects function, which is all of these buildings. The main object function also has a nested for loop for X and Z, except that the size of this area is going to be smaller than the size of this area. I decide on whether there's going to be a building and how big that building is going to be. So after translating to the initial XYZ location to draw the box, I translate again to half the size of the box that's going to be drawn. Because wherever you translate to, the box is going to be drawn in the middle of that translate spot. If I drew the box at ground level, then half of the building would be underground. After I draw my box, which is the shape of the building, then I have a make windows function. In the windows function, I have a nested for loop with J and I. I represents my X value and J represents my Y value. Here I am using Y because the windows are going up and down. I need the window to appear on both sides of the building. So instead of making individual windows all on one side of the building and then moving to the other side, I just make one long window that goes all the way through the building and pokes out both sides. After the building gets made, I call a make cars function because you can see here that there are some cars on the sides of the building. So there's a whole function just to draw the cars. This is another project of mine in WebGL. I have rotated the canvas 90 degrees uh, and we're looking down at the drawing. These are cylinders and these are boxes in between the cylinders. There's a chance that this will be drawn orthographic. There's also a chance that this will be tilted. This is tilted and orthographic. And then here is tilted and not orthographic. Uh, also this one, the height is a little higher. Here's another project in WebGL, Celtic knots. These are all lines and curved vertexes and I'm drawing them so that they go underneath each other, uh, which is why I'm using WebGL. There's a library called 3JS, which is used for WebGL. Here's an example of something drawn with 3JS. So obviously there's a lot that could be done, though this is way advanced. Here's something that you could probably manage. There's plenty of documentation to learn how to use this. I'm going to wrap it up here. Links will be in the video description. In the next video, we'll be looking at return, break, and continue, which are three ways to interrupt a process. Love to read your comments. Post your art on my Discord. If you like the video, please like it. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.